of it. If you're going to write nonfiction, you're going to have to say, well, this happened, I believe this occurred, I have to keep it in question, but nevertheless. But what about what the inside knows, the person underneath the person, as it were? And I began, I sort of dipped my foot into this with The Grays, which was a novel about a lot of things I had heard about, like this, if you read The Grays, this strange aircraft it's supposed to be quite real, the TR aircraft. It's based on partly on alien technology and 
partly on our attempts to sort of do a to duplicate it, and uh, the the lady in it who who engages in the uh, in the dialogue with the alien, the intelligence operative, is supposedly somebody real, and but I can't prove any of that, so it comes out in a book of fiction. Now, with 2012, I began to think about the year 2012, and some years ago when I met Jose Arguez and, and then subsequently interviewed him on Dreamland or Coast, I forget where, but in any case, I did that. And a fascinating man with a fascinating theory, but it was just a theory. Now, it's years later, it's, that was about maybe 2000, 2001, 2007, and we see the predictions in the Popovo about the changes coming. Uh, last week, the Northwest Passage unexpectedly opened. They said, for the first time since records have been kept since in 1978, the truth is, it's the first time in the history of this species in, in, in North America that it has opened. It has never been opened before. And it happened because 318,000 square miles more ice melted this summer in that part of the world than we expected to melt even a year ago. So, and then we have a, an increasingly intense amount of earthquake and volcanic activity on the planet. NASA is predicting that the next solar cycle, due to start wind in 2011 and reaches peak in 2012, is going to be the most intense in history. So I thought to myself, maybe the Maya knew something. And then I thought to myself, but if they knew so much, what happened to them? And that's all kind of creepy, isn't it? I mean, you know, they're, they had this extraordinary inner knowledge, but they went extinct at the same time. So maybe it's a maybe there's a voice that's speaking to us out of the past. And I began to think in terms of fiction and suddenly this idea of writing a fiction not about what I think may happen in 2012, not directly, uh, but rather about my imagination's take on the change and what it's really all about. I thought for a long time that our close encounter experiences have to do more than anything with our souls, more than our bodies. I know so many people in the close encounter experience, and there's a certain personality type. Most people who have close encounters are very bright, not necessarily all that well educated, rather gentle people. Uh, and it's a, it's a consistent pattern throughout the whole experience. As if somebody is, is building something among these people. So what might they be doing? What might they be building? They might be building a new way of looking at the world and a new way of living and being. And it has to do, and if you follow my, if you go on my website and you're subscribed to it, you'll learn a lot about so-called triads things in groups of three, with a negative side, a positive side, and then the balancing side in the middle. So I wanted to explore what that, that is in, in all of its real majesty and intensity, that simple idea. So I came up with the thought of three separate universes, all right here, parallel universes, based on the idea that physicists are now, now saying this is not imaginary, it's quite real. And one of them is a positive universe, and it's a universe in which it's very much like this one, except World War I never happened. The Archduke Franz Ferdinand was never assassinated in the summer of, of 1914. So they have a whole much milder, much softer, gentler reality than we do. Then the bad side. The bad side, the dinosaurs never went extinct, and the intelligent species is reptilian, and a lot of us know that whole reptilian ethos that's kind of in the background of the close encounter experience. We all are kind of frightened by that, but nobody ever really, a few people see them, but mostly we don't. So is it real or not? Well, I, I thought I would explore that as the dark side. So you have the dark side, full of knowledge and hungry to escape from the boundaries of its being. The, bright, the light side, gentle, open, fertile, welcoming and in great danger. And then you have, in our world, the everyman, us. In this case, a poor writer. I figured, you know, I know a lot about 
writer's getting in trouble, and so I'll put, uh, this guy's going to get in a lot of trouble. I'll make him a writer. And he, is, he, is, he ends up in a situation where he's writing a novel that he realizes is actually a real history of what's unfolding in these other two parallel universes. And he ends up trying to do what we all, in this middle world of ours, of our being, are trying to do all the time to bring balance to these two opposing forces, the dark and the light, the dark and the light, the yin and the yang. This is what our souls are doing. This is what we are about here. And the war for souls is about deciding where will we go, what direction will we go in. And I have a feeling that as we come toward 2012, quite possibly, there's going to be a fundamental decision made at some point as this planet's ability to support us collapses around our ears, we're going to make, be making some very fundamental decisions about who we are and about where the human species is going. And this is sort of the vein I'm writing in right now. I'm going to read you, and then open it up to questions, just the last couple of paragraphs of the prologue to 2012. Okay, now I, I will preface this by saying I'm not giving away enough to ruin the book for you, because this is only on page 20. But in order to let you understand exactly what is where we are, this is happening in the good universe, not in our universe. The Great Pyramid has just exploded. And an archaeologist who was working in it has gotten out just by the skin of his teeth. Even his ears had stopped ringing. This is some hours later. He turned away unwilling or unable to stare any longer at the gaping dark eye that had replaced that great wonder. A great dark black lens has appeared in the ground where the pyramid was. Eternal pyramid, built for the ages. How long had it taken to destroy it? No more than five minutes. He'd started back downstairs when he hesitated. He's on, at, a, at the Mina Hotel overlooking the now remains of the Great Pyramid. This was a nightmare of some kind. He wasn't awake, but he was. He turned back, and there it was again. Nothing to call it but a lens, huge, glaring darkly upward at sky, at a, the sky at, at sky, into which it had spit the pyramid. As old as it must be, it seemed perfect, fresh, and new, come up out of the earth like some demon's eye that had opened after a sleep that had crossed the ages, which was exactly what had happened. That's the beginning, anyway, of this journey through the world of balancing the dark and the light. Thank you, and I'm going to open the floor to questions now. Yes, ma'am. Uh, yeah, um, I want to know your opinion about the Mayans. I mean, the calendar, in my opinion, wasn't written by them, really. It was written by the ancient astronauts. And um, do you also believe that the uh, history of Atlantis is in the Great Pyramid? Well, it's a good question. The question, I'll repeat the questions because I know some of you won't be able to hear them in the back. The question was, she wonders what my thoughts are about the Maya. She doesn't believe that the Maya necessarily uh, created the calendar, and uh, she wonders if, if there's some relationship with Atlantis. You know, I, along with William Henry, who is a co-host on my show on Dreamland, we've been for quite a few years exploring the whole issue of why it is that parts of the past look more like echoes of something greater than they do like something uh, that was just originated. Like, for example, uh, not only the pyramids, but so much else in Egypt suggests extraordinary construction capabilities and skills. For example, there are thousands of diorite little jars and bowls and pots found in Egypt from as long ago as 2000 BC. The problem with these, the way these were made is we do not have drills now that could actually do that to diorite because we don't have drills that could be thin enough to carve out the interior of these little tiny, like almost like perfume jars that are also uh, strong enough. And I, uh, a friend of ours, and I, Grant Hancock, has studied this extensively. He's quite certain that such drills don't exist now. So how is it that they existed now 3,000 years ago, 2000 BC? And 
if you if you look at the Egyptian religion with its elaborate ritual and its it's almost as if somebody was watching something that was being done a long time ago some kind of activity and and whoever was doing these activities these say scientific activities left or something happened to them and and the people who really didn't understand continued manipulating the tools or whatever it was that they left behind in hopes of achieving the same results that the ones who actually knew what they were doing achieved. Now let me explain that a little bit more with a modern story. Uh, when the United States Air Force arrived in New Guinea in, uh, uh, in, the, in, the, in 1944, they brought airplanes and the airplanes disgorged all kinds of wealth unimaginable to the Highlanders who, they, who were seeing this all for the first time in their lives and they began to create what were called cargo cults. And in fact, there's, there was even for a long time a member of the Australian Parliament who was a cargo cult was his religion. He worshipped the back page of an old Agatha Christie novel. It's laughable to us, but it's actually not at all. Because what these people did was they built bamboo and leaf airplanes. They built little refrigerators out of bamboo and they moved about carrying out ritual activities that looked to them like what the Air Force personnel were doing, and then they opened their refrigerators in hopes of getting beer and stuff out. It didn't work, but that's the way the human mind deals with the unknown on one level. And the Egyptian religion could be a very much a parallel to that, a much more elaborate and elaborated parallel to that, but essentially a cargo cult that reflects earlier activities that actually meant something, the meaning of which, the origin of which, and the people who performed them all lost. Next question. Yes, sir. You stated that the Mayas no longer exist. How big the difference? They do exist in southern Mexico, Guatemala, other yes. areas in Central America. Yeah, I'm, Wasn't I'm the descendants of the pure blood Mayas, and they are pure blood Mayas that exist today. As long as we believe that they do not exist, we will never learn about their secrets, their mysteries, on healing, on nutrition, and even on 2012. They do exist, and they shame us. Well, the. Uh I knew when I said that that uh, someone would call me on it because I had I, I should have said that the civilization that had grown up had ceased to exist, and that I think was the more accurate statement. Whether or not there are people among the Maya now who know, who have preserved the knowledge uh, that led to the creation of the calendar, or not, I. I don't know. I wish I did know. Uh, it's a, but it's a fascinating possibility, certainly. Uh, next question. Yes, sir. Are you afraid that, the two parts of this question, are you afraid that the uh, fiction might take your nonfiction work? And a, a part of that is because of your contact experience, you feel like a part of your imagination is open to places in order to bring through fiction. So, do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Do, do, do I feel that my fiction might taint my nonfiction? And uh, I, I'm going to. Uh, the second question I, was about having that contact experience opened you to areas of your no. own consciousness. Has, has the yeah. yeah has the contact experience opened me to areas of my own consciousness that are my own mind, my imagination yes. that I wouldn't have been open to before? Well, certainly, it has totally changed my life. Uh, it is made, I, there was one person before December the 26th, 1985, and another person afterwards. The person before was, was lived in another world. This world that I live in now is a, has gone from being a, 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 a confused, desperate kind of post-birth, post-traumatic, world of 1985, 1986, 1987, up into the 90s, to being what it is now, which is a very 
elaborately multi-dimensional world of, in my mind, of the imagination and of my creativity intimately connected with my close encounter experiences, with things I have learned from it that I remember and things I have learned from it that I'm sure I don't remember. And it's those things that, I, that, that I'm writing my fiction about and, and drawing my fiction from. Uh, does it, 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 it could, you could say that the fiction could taint the non-fiction, certainly. Uh, uh, you, you, if you wanted to, if you wanted to say, well, he's a fiction writer, look at these books. Now he's beginning to exploit his experiences in fiction. Well, th that comes from, a, from a, a, a denial of the validity of art and of, uh, of an artist's work that is sort of fundamental, and I would expect to see it in a skeptical inquirer, but hopefully not among us. Uh, because the truth is, in order to be true to myself as a novelist, and that's what I am fundamentally, I must find the place in me that this emerges as fiction. In other words, how will I ever know what the reality is? Because the reality, we, 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 we have in our, we always say in our culture, just is imagination, just her imagination. This incredible tool, which has been dropped by this culture, by Western culture, is essential to our understanding of the real world around us. And quantum physics is beginning to realize this as they begin to see more and more how intimately connected perception and reality actually are. Uh, the, the weight of ongoing events makes it impossible for us to literally create our own realities. But I tell you this in all truth, there will come a time when we are under so much pressure from the declining environment around us, and whether it be in 2012 or 2050, I have no idea, that we will make this breakthrough. We're not going to go extinct. We're just going to have a really hard time. And out of that is going to become come a new kind of mankind. So, next question. Thank you. Yes, same thing. You're welcome. What did I get out of writing the book? Well, I, I, I am struggling with something that I learned from my close encounter experiences about what I referred to in the talk about triads is really, really important to me and uh, to understand because it, it, like what Mr. Fuller called the, the triangle, the triad, the building block of the universe. And if you understand that dynamic of energies between those three things of the harmonizing element and the two opposing elements, you really begin to understand yourself in a completely new way. And uh, so in delving into this in the book, I explored those energies and I explored them in myself at the same time. I began to have a much more objective view of myself. Uh, I began to be able to look upon living life more as a, uh, not only from within life, but from another place that seems to be a little bit uh, more removed from it. You know, the riddle of the Sphinx was what happened, what has the loins of a bull, or the strength of a bull, the courage of a lion, and the intelligence of a man, and the wings on the Sphinx, not on the Sphinx in, in, in Egypt, but on the most Sphinxes are uh, uh, shown with wings. It's the eagle, because when the eagle uh, uh, spreads his wings and flies, he can look down on life and see it in a much larger way and in actually a terribly more energetic way. This is what I'm after. This is what my writing of my fiction is about, what I'm trying to make it do for me, what I hope it will help others do for themselves. Yes, ma'am. Do you feel that contactees are interconnecting in uh, more and more complex ways, if you will, interesting ways over the years? Do you see a pattern of how we're all kind of do I see that whether or not contactees are uh, interconnecting in deeper, more complex ways over time? Well, something is certainly happening to us. Certainly. I, 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 we are expanding 
our minds and our realities in all kinds of remarkable ways. Uh, we are beginning to be able to come together. A lot of us, like for example, I got a letter just the other day from a guy who had a, a, one of these bookstore encounters here in Manhattan. I, after Communion was published, there were a number of so-called bookstore encounters with someone who looked a lot like the lady on the cover of Communion. And one of them was our one of our editors at uh, William Morrow and Company, the gentleman who happened to be named Bruce Lee, was not the same man, uh, uh, went into the Madison Avenue bookstop shop uh, up on Madison Avenue and he had an encounter to his mate. He was looking at the shelving of the book and to his astonishment, he saw these two people flipping through the book. And uh, th then they suddenly... They saw him looking at them because he was interested. He's, a, he's how interested are they in the book? What are they saying about it? Uh, they stopped and they looked up at him, and they had the huge black eyes. They were sort of wearing overcoats and hats, and uh, he was appalled. And he decided to leave the store, as you might understand. I can't blame him. He turned around and left the store. They walked out behind him talking to each other about how the book was all wrong. And so I was on tour at the time, and the editor, another editor at Morrow comes up, calls and says, I've got good news and bad news. The good news is, we know you're not faking it anymore. I said, well, that's a relief, because they've all been giving me what for the whole time, as you can imagine. People had known me for years, and suddenly I come out with this. He said, but unfortunately, the aliens have told us that your book's all wrong. <laughs> I said, well, I was, I, I decided it had to be a practical joke. There had been a lot of practical, I was not unknown to play an occasional practical joke as Anne and a couple of other people in here know, uh, victims. Uh, but in any case, uh, the, I had him take a lie detector test and I told the lie detector guy, I said, listen, this is your chance. He's, I'd already passed his test and he was very upset about it because he, he felt like it was going to give polygraphing a bad name. So uh, I said, this is your chance. This guy's got to be lying. He said, send him down. So he goes down and he, he calls me up at the, the, later that afternoon. He says, well, I took the test. I said, how'd you do? He said, oh, I passed it, but that guy is a really mean. Boy, I've got bruises all over my chest from that thing. He yelled at me. So I called the lie detector guy and said, look, he said, I know my system is not foolproof, but I've been doing this for the city of New York, for the police department, for 30 years. And I can tell you right now, that man's not lying. I said, my God. So that was then. Now, all of these years later, this letter comes from someone who saw the same person in another nearby bookstore right at about the same time. And it's taken him this long to be able to send the letter and write about it. But that kind of opening is happening among us all as, as change on the planet accelerates, change within us accelerates too. I do hope that it has some meaning, that something has been done that will help this beautiful human species to not just to surmount the difficulties that we face now, but to thrive in the future that's coming. Uh, yes, sir. Well, just change the subject to climate change. In the years since you started writing about that and raised that issue, and then you see things like Hurricane Katrina, tsunami, increasing volcanoes and earthquakes. How does that make you? How does it make you feel? How does it make me feel that climate change is happening, pretty much along the lines of? two books I wrote, actually. One in uh, 1984 called Nature's End, and then the next one in 1999 called Superstorm. Uh, well, it makes me feel bad, uh, because I remember very well in 1984, I had a press conference in Washington with all the leading press environmental reporters, all the reporters from the various big magazines and newspapers, and they scoffed at my book. This is just fiction. It's never going to happen. Uh, it had, <laughs> it's all happened and is happening now. Uh, Superstorm, what is so frightening about it is not that it is liable to happen, but that it might not. 
because things are so much worse than we thought they would be that it could be that the climate, that the global heating will literally break through that level and there will never be any kind of sudden snapback to another, to another climate form at all. That the heating will just continue and continue and continue. Where it will stop, nobody knows. It will stop when there are not enough of us to sustain this medium-sized but continuously exploding volcano that is human life on Earth on one level, because we are, we, are, we are creatures who have discovered fire and we use fire. So we are like a volcano. We, we even emit a lot of the same gases, carbon dioxide, sulfur dioxide, and so forth, that a volcano does. And we're going to pay the price for this, unfortunately. Uh, it makes me feel, you know, I was accused on my radio program last week by a guy uh, who said that by talking about all of these dangers, I was actually bringing them all. But it was my fault. And I thought, gee, how, how primitive can our thinking get? How far back can we go? How far back will fear take some of us? Well, it's not going to take me back at, at all. I don't intend to go for that kind of thinking at all. I've always, I've laughed that, that actually, like he's got the secret school here, that my, 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 my prophecies, which in the secret school are all so dead wrong, that maybe I should prophesy more. Maybe I should prophesy the end of the world. <laughs> and, get, and maybe it'll save us all. But maybe, maybe I actually have the opposite effect. Next question. We've got time for, do we have time? Where is it? Do we have time for another question or two? Oh, to 7.30? Oh, great. Okay, just a Quite a number of years, it's a specific question. Quite a number of years ago, you, myself, and Donna, while all three of us were at war, discussed a whole big thing about Gurdjieff. She asked me, because you couldn't be here tonight, are you still involved? In the Gurdjieff Foundation? Yeah. Okay, she was uh, the nurse of our anonized doctor, Dr. Ward Cunningham Rundles, uh, when we lived in New York. And I guess you, you sort of got a lot of this kind of up close and personal right at the beginning of it. Because, yeah, you must have. Uh, he fascinated all of us. We adored him. Well, thank you. Uh, Dr. Ward was a great guy. He had an interesting way, though, of you ended up sitting in his office butt naked uh, a lot. <laughs> Something that happened in his office uh, when, when he did a physical. Uh, he would always report on the physical in his office. And I was warned about this by other patients. He said, they said he'll, say, he'll tell you to come out this door, and you come out the door, and you'll still be naked, so definitely put your clothes on. He won't say to do that. But he, he was a fabulous guy. And, and uh, she refers to the Gurdjieff Foundation. I was, I spent from 19, Ann and I, from 1970 to 1983, involved in the Gurdjieff Foundation here in New York. And it was an incredibly important experience for us. Uh, my, the God rest their souls, the two people who were most important to us were Joseph Stein and William Siegel. And uh, Mr. Siegel was a truly conscious human being. He was, and also P.L. Travers, Pamela Travers, was very wonderful to us. And uh, she, was, she was deeply involved in esoteric work. It's not in her biography, but she was. Uh, uh, and I don't think that I would have had the close encounter experience of the visitors in my life if this hadn't happened first. But Mr. Siegel, yeah, I, I had this thing that became the path, this way that was in the tarot, became my book, The Path, uh, which will be republished, by the way, along with the key, hopefully at the end of October. Uh, anyway, that I showed to him, and he said, you know, it's very profound. And I said, what does it have any meaning? Does it have any value? And he said, well, you know what you need to do is you need to take it out into life and live it and find out if it has any value. And I said, are you telling me that I should leave the work? And he said, I'm telling you that you should do what you know you need to do. And so I did leave the work. A couple of years passed, and a new master showed up in the form of these people who at first really kicked me around, but they also woke me up. It wasn't pretty, but it worked. Uh, 
and I know there's a lot of people who believe that evil aliens and so forth, and I just, I don't reject that. I accept that as part of the experience, and part of my experience, certainly. But at the same time, I refuse to fear. I will not fear. I will replace the fear with questions. And so, the Gurdjieff, I'm not involved in it anymore, but the two ideas of the Law of Three and the Law of Seven were of seminal importance in my subsequent work with the visitors, and they brought that to me very definitely. I could not have understood what they were trying to communicate to me without the Gurdjieff Foundation beforehand. So. His, his daughter, Dushka, lives here in New York. Ogashi, oh, are you in the foundation now? Yeah, I, well, she's not involved because I think there's, there's a real big debacle going on, but I spoke to her a few years ago. Well, of course, there's a the Gurdjieff Foundation. Her. There's always a big debacle going on, so it's no big deal. That's a human institution. Uh, a human institution without a big debacle, you got to know that there are people chained in the basement somewhere. Uh, okay, next question. I think that being a is like being a Catholic or an alcoholic. There's no such thing as a Jigia. My wife says being a Jigia is like being a Catholic or an alcoholic. There's really no such thing as an X. <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah, I have this incredible fascination with uh, Mars and the whole connection between sure. Egypt. And I was wondering how you felt about the exploded planet theory uh, and if we could actually have come from, uh, from Mars. He asks, he says he has a, an incredible fascination with Mars. He asks about the exploded planet theory. Could we actually have come from Mars? Uh, and he has a copy of The Secret School in his hand. Your when experience. I, yeah, here. when I was a little boy, I was obsessed with Mars. And I'll tell you one of the most remarkable things that ever happened in my life was when a friend of mine uh, here in New York, uh, John Glidman, uh, called me up and said, I have got these remarkable pictures of the surface of Mars from a Viking uh, orbiter. Come down and see them. And I met. Richard Hoagland at his house, and we looked at these pictures. Richard had brought them, and entered into a dialogue in, in, in the sort of pre-internet. There was like a messaging system on computers then about Mars, uh, because it was perfectly clear. It's been obscured by polit. The reality of what is on Mars has probably been, been obscured by skillful politics and frightened science. I doubt very much that we will ever be able to truly look at it. And I think there's a reason for that that goes to uh, a remarkable theory from Barbara Hand Plow in her book, C Catastrophobia, where she says we are in a state of enforced amnesia about an enormous catastrophe that happened in the past that was perhaps even a war. And after all, if you look at the Indian records, you see stories of, a, of, a, of an incredible war in space that must have, if it really happened, been an extraordinary trauma for us. Uh, so perhaps there was a time when we were a star-faring species, when we did inhabit other planets, maybe even Mars. Maybe we did come from there. Maybe there was some kind of genetic ma manipulation that caused this species, which had been going along here so quietly for a hundred thousand years, an almost unimaginable length of time, when we were Homo sapiens, we really weren't doing anything. We were living in a timeless kind of state. And then suddenly, some people, children, teenagers, by the way, went into caves at Lascaux about 30,000 years ago and began to paint these extraordinary pictures. They had changed in some fundamental way. They had become what we are now, human. And if you look, by the way, at, at, you'll find that we were in a very similar situ situation astronomically then as we are now. And I think we are experiencing in ourselves a similar change now. Uh, so yes, I think it's quite possible that there was a lot more in, there in the past. But I must also say that the, that that the science, as it goes on, if it doesn't support this, because we're going to get more and more information from Mars and more and more detailed information, and there comes a point where even uh, people like Michael Mallon would have to admit that there was something extraordinary in his pictures. The pyramid connection. Yeah, exactly, the pyramid connection. But if it's not true, if Mars is just 
an ancient rocky planet where nothing much has actually happened for billions of years. Then it gets back to the more enormous mystery, and the reason I'm exploring this in fiction, and that is when we hold up a mirror to the universe and to ourselves, what are we really seeing? What are we? This is the question always when we look at our alternative pasts, at our possible futures, and at the extraordinary mystery of the explosion of human consciousness and human knowledge that has taken place over the past 150 years, most of it over the past 50 years, you have to ask, what are we? And then I ask myself a question like this, what if we are alone? Just to play with it. We live by the idea that these are aliens that have come to us. What if they're not? What if there's something totally removed from that? What if they're, for example, us from our own futures? Why is it? Maybe that's why we have this strange equivocal relationship with them. Uh, what if they are our own dead? The dead appear with the visitors all the time. People, we've got thousands of letters. People seeing their own dead friends and relatives uh, with visitors. We've got a lady nodding right here who I know has had that experience personally uh, because I know of her experiences. And, uh, uh, what does that all mean? So the question becomes, not so much what, where we came from. Did we come from Mars? Did we come from some remarkable lost past? What are we now? That's the question. Okay, so let's, yes sir. If it doesn't take too much time, from a mind calendar perspective, what does it mean? Well, okay. Uh, what does the year 2012 mean in the Mayan calendar? On December the 21st, 2012, that they, they somehow calculated to that particular sol solstice. The Mayan long count calendar ends. It doesn't go past that day. And uh, there are various theories about where the, our, 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 our solar system and planet will be in relation to the center of the galaxy, but no clear evidence. And I questioned Jose Arbias who made this discovery closely about this, there's no absolute evidence that that the Mayans did know about the center of the galaxy. He thinks they did, and he thinks that the moment that we crossed the plane of the center of the galaxy uh, 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 in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the journey of this solar system, this planet, into its future, that that's the moment, December the 21st, 2012, at midnight. Uh, whether that's true or not, I don't know, but the calculation is based on uh, is based on a working back from that particular uh, date uh, by the Mayan. Why they chose that date is still unknown. Jose would say it's because they knew we were exactly where we would be in relation to the center of the galaxy, and they worked the whole calendar back from that moment. Uh, he may be right. I don't know, but that's what it is. I hope that answers the yes, sir. Um, sure. Have have the visitors given you any? Um insight into whether either they know or what actually will be the case if there is a dieback, what comes next? That's a good question. Have the visitors given me any indication if they know that there will be a dieback of this species and if so, what happens next? No direct, nothing direct. A dieback meaning that the species becomes overwhelmed by environmental change and more people start to die than are born and that that continues on for X number of years until the planetary, planet's environment is able to rebalance itself. And, you know, people get very emotional about this, of course, but you have to remember nature is just numbers. It's numbers. Uh, and two and two always equals four in nature. It never equals 1.999998. But that, that difference is us praying. Uh, <laughs> and we, we usually don't get that get that difference. In any case, uh, they haven't really directly, I, would, I have wondered if they are aliens, why aren't they more open about their presence here? And I, I have some very s solid answers to that question, uh, uh, which I believe are probably true. One of them being that it was, there was an article in, um, in Science Magazine in April of 1977 by D.B.H. Kuiper and Michael Morris, two very prominent, uh, uh, I guess, uh, astrophysicists, speculating, it's just a short little article, speculating 
that if aliens came here from another planet, another solar system, another star system, their knowledge would be so extensive of the universe that there would only be one thing they would want from us, which is innovation. To, to, to be able to observe us making discoveries that perhaps would be new discoveries for the first time. They would be here looking for something new, and therefore they would keep their presence completely secret. And the reason they would do that is, as soon as we became aware of their presence, we would immediately refocus our whole culture toward them. Just like happens in primitive societies on this planet, when the, when the Europeans with their advanced technology and their desirable artifacts show up, the local culture becomes plunged into a sense of irrelevancy. Its mythology ceases to have meaning for it, and it begins to feel itself as helpless, powerless, and lacking in knowledge. And that would happen to us. A whole planet with culture would be, uh, uh, would, 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 would be disempowered. So, however, if we're desperate, if we're not going to make it, would they show up and help us? There's no evidence of that right now, or is there? Is a lot of it sitting in this room? We don't know what will happen from us and through us, but they have certainly done something here. I thought maybe they made a genetic model of mankind, and they we just happened to be people whose genes they needed, you know, for a museum uh, or for or for a, like a sort of seed saver factory. I mean, who knows what they might have been doing? But maybe there's something else here. Maybe there is something even that leads toward a better future for mankind. That's, of course, my hope. Yes, ma'am. Is it possible that the contact is extra-dimensional rather than extraterrestrial? Well, two years ago I would have said that's very problematic. Now I think it might be more likely than extraterrestrial. And the reason is that the science is becoming extremely clear. That and just Anne on our she does our website and she's constantly telling me about these new science stories that are coming up. Where uh, the, thank you. Somebody knows. I'm uh, dying too. Uh, I am a sweater, being from Texas. I mean, you don't live down there for long if you can't sweat. Uh, <laughs> the dry people all move north. Uh, uh, anyway, the uh, uh, where was I? Oh yeah, about parallel universes. The the possibility is it is actually highly likely that there are other parallel universes around here. I had a fascinating conversation with um, the author. No, no, no. Uh, the author of the of the uh, Colm Kelleher. Yeah. Uh, Colm Kelleher was the uh, head of the National Institute for Discovery Sciences branch in Utah, which. Robert Bigelow, the mysterious billionaire, founded this institute to basically test the leading edge of science and reality. And he bought this ranch because it was a ranch on which all kinds of incredible things were happening all the time. Strange animals were seen, balls of light, UFOs, constantly. And so just when the ranch was turning over, the family that had owned it was still on the ranch. Suddenly, I believe, Colm got a call from them. They'd had an incredible experience. He rushed out there with some other scientists, and what had happened was this. They'd been behind their house near a little corral where there were some goats, when an enormous wolf had come up out of a marsh and walked right up to them. They had actually touched this animal, which was chest high to a man. I mean, I have to tell you, you have to admire Utah ranchers. I mean, there, no one said anything about getting up on the roof or going inside or anything. But anyway, they touched this thing, and it, then it walked over and got into the corral and began to bother the goats. So the man went into the house at this point and got a gun and went and shot the thing a number of times, and the, the bullets did nothing to it. But it was as material-looking as anything. It then turned around, went back into the marsh, and, and, and was gone from sight. Colm and his people went down there and they found the footprints and tracked them right up to the place where they just ceased to be. And they were able to estimate 
the weight of the animal by the depth of the footprints in this soil. Because, you know, they were scientists. They figured it weighed about 300 pounds, which was enormous for a wolf. There was once a wolf in North America called the dire wolf, which died out in this, in this country 10,000 years ago, uh, 15,000 years ago, long before Europeans arrived. It was associated with the fauna of the Ice Age. So they once existed here. Perhaps in a parallel universe, we didn't get to North America. The Ice Age maybe didn't end, and they still exist there. And if and, and in in which case, perhaps these creatures have evolved a way of moving between universes in order as a defense mechanism, for example. Perhaps that's why we never can catch Bigfoot or the Loch Ness Monster, because they go into another universe when threatened. It's per it seems fanciful, but it, it isn't anymore. It seems perfectly possible. That said, uh, 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 that said, I did talk to Sir Martin Rees, the Astronomer Royal, about this, and he said it's wonderfully fascinating to speculate, but right now we believe that while the barrier between universes might be almost infinitely thin, the amount of energy necessary to move from one to the other might exceed the energy available in both universes put together. So all I can say is nature's funny. Nature always has these funny workarounds that we don't expect. So yes, sir. This is a human interest question, and I'm asking it because I did see a, a UFO, so I believe that they do exist. Um, could it be that these very intelligent beings uh, time traveling to their history and therefore cannot interfere with what is present for us because ultimately it will be done down the road? Well, that's an interesting question. Could it be that they are time travelers? And uh, if so, uh, it, it could, could it be that if they are time travelers, actually I'll take it a little farther, it may be that they can't interfere. I had a fascinating encounter with the visitors about time travel one time. When I was getting, I would get, they would get physically close to me, but not so close that I could touch them. And if I closed my eyes and relaxed, I would see pictures. And I could ask questions in my head, and they would be answered with pictures. I asked a question about the nature of time, and they showed me water, something like a machine compressing it, and then ice. And then they showed me bubbles in the ice with light in them. And I thought to myself, I understand what this is saying to me. The water is the future, the compressor is the present, the ice is the past, and the bubbles are the places you can go into the past to maybe look at it or maybe even affect small changes that do something to the future. Now, that said, more recently, there's been a fascinating, the latest copy of The New Scientist, or last week's copy anyway, has a remarkable article in it on the front page about the possibility that we may be living, or no, I'm sorry, this is in the New York Times. Uh, this is in the New York Times last week sometime. That we may be living, or, or maybe it was on another country, in a, in, not in a real universe at all. That this may be a simulation created by people in the future who are modeling their own past. New York Times. Yeah. New York Times, yeah. And we would not be able, this is, a, this is an institute, the Institute for the Human Future at Oxford came up with this idea. It's a wonderful organization. That we would not be able to tell if we were all circuitry, if we're not even here. And the, the director of this institute said he thinks there's maybe as much as a 20% chance that this may be completely or only or partly true of life on this earth. That we may not all even be real. Well, why doesn't that surprise us? Uh, okay, we do have time now for one more. Yes, sir. You've done a lot of work with uh, group meditation and, yes. and, uh, and that sort of work, group expectation. I was wondering, what um, uh, do, you, do you feel like, after all your work with that, that our, our expectation in group telepathy can influence how the world uh, develops? Do I feel that group meditation can influence how the world evolves? I don't know if it can go so far as to actually influence how the world changes. In other words, can we roll back climate change with meditation or something? Uh, 
the, the reason I'm not sure of that is that there is an enormous force, an, a force of an inertial force of entropy that is hugely energetic in, in, in the sense that it weighs so much and it is the it is the composite of everything that has been done in a given direction over all of history. And to change that with the mind seems to me to be impossible on the one hand. On the other hand, when I read this degree to which perception, uh, the scientists are beginning to believe that perception governs the way reality unfolds, I think that somewhere there is a key that we have to turn in ourselves and in the world around us. And I have a feeling that it's pressure that will do it, as I said earlier. In other words, the more intense this, 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 the, the, the changes of the, the planetary changes become, the more extraordinary the human response will be. And will we make a leap into another level of reality where the planet becomes a tool of the human mind rather than the human mind being a victim of the planet? Let's hope, and perhaps on that note, it's time to quit. Now, I'm going to sign books. I don't know what to oh, Thank you. Welcome to the Culture of Contact. Contact begins now.